Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. This is episode 5 of my New Jerusalem playlist. This is part of a series, so if I don't address everything here, then I'll have addressed it in a previous video or in future videos. So make sure to check out the rest of the videos on the playlist. And in this video, we're going to talk about a few verses in DNC section 45 that have to do with the New Jerusalem being a piece of safety and refuge, that the terror of the Lord is going to be there that the wicked wouldn't dare flee to Zion because of the terror of the Lord. And uh, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to decide if you're going to flee physically to Zion or New Jerusalem or fight your neighbors in hand-to-hand -hand combat or small arms combat or something like that. And so uh, there's other ideas out there that what this means is that there's going to be some kind of super supernatural protection over the city, whether it's like a force field or advanced technology from the 10 lost tribes or some other thing. And uh, that it's all literal and it's about combat and it's about fighting and it's about physical safety. So what we're going to do is read these verses and then we're going to, again, we're going to define New Jerusalem uh, according to Joseph Fielding Smith. And then we're going to go through a bunch of quotes from Joseph Smith, um, George Q. Cannon, Down H. Oaks, and others. Okay, so DNC 45, starting in verse 66. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall also be there also shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it, and it shall be called Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, let us not go up to, to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations and shall come to Zion singing with songs of everlasting joy. Okay? So you can see how a literal interpretation of this would make you think that everybody across the entire world, everyone's going to go to New Jerusalem if you're righteous, and you're a member of the church, in that there's going to be what sounds like World War Three and civil wars and just general chaos happening all over. And so that's the only place where you're going to find safety and peace from war. Okay, so now let's remind ourselves of one of the definitions of New Jerusalem. And then we'll go into the quotes that have to do with these scriptures. One by Joseph Smith himself, where he expounds on that, and then others. Okay, Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 3. The vision of John and the revelation to Joseph Smith both have reference to the same event, the second coming of our Lord in his power and glory to receive his church or kingdom, the new Jerusalem being the capital city of the church. And there is no difference in the meaning, whether reference is to the church or to the new Jerusalem. For the righteous will have inheritance in the new Jerusalem, Therefore, the bride of the Lamb is the organization of the righteous who have inheritance in the holy city. Okay, now we'll go to Joseph Smith in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, uh, page 239, Column B. There will be here and there a stake for the gathering of the saints. Some may have cried peace, but the saints and the world will have little peace from henceforth. Let, us not let, let this not hinder us from going to the stakes, okay, to the stakes, for God has told us to flee, and he references, or he cites, D&C 45, verse 68, and that says, and it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. So Joseph Smith, expounding on that. Let, us not, let this not hinder us from going to the stakes, for God has told us to flee, not dallying, or we shall be scattered, one here and another there, 
There your children shall be blessed, and you in the midst of your friends of our friend sorry, in the midst of friends where you may be blessed. The gospel net gathers of every kind. I prophesy that that man who tarries after he has an opportunity of going will be afflicted by the devil. Wars are at hand, we must not delay, but we are not required to sacrifice. We ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. When wars come, we shall have to flee to Zion. The cry is to make he- is to make haste. The last revelation says, "Ye shall not have time to have gone over the earth until these things come." It will come as did the cholera, war, fires, and earthquakes, one pestilence after another, etc., until the Ancient of Days come. Then judgment will be given to the saints. Whatever you hear about me or Kirtland, take no notice of it, for if it be a place of refuge, the devil will use his greatest efforts to trap the saints. You must make yourselves acquainted with those men who, like Daniel, pray three times a day to the house of the Lord, Look to the presidency and receive instruction. Every man who is afraid, covetous, etc., will be taken in a snare. The time is soon coming when no man will have any peace but in Zion and her stakes. Okay? And at this moment, we have stakes all throughout the entire world. And that's where you're supposed to gather. Okay. Journal of Discourses, Volume 23. Uh, This is George Q. Cannon. If you don't know who that is, he was first counselor in the first presidency. And this is what he says. There is, <clears throat> there is this that is most extraordinary connected with us as a people. God in the beginning made a promise to us, which has been oft repeated that notwithstanding all our enemies should, should do against us, we should have peace. Peace should reign in our hearts and in our habitations. Peace should be in our land and brood over us as a people. This is one of the great promises God made to us in the beginning. Read the closing verses of the 45th section of the Doctrine and Covenants and see what God has said concerning Zion and the promises that are therein embodied respecting us as a people. And then he cites uh, our scriptures right there that we've read. That when our nations should be at war, when neighbor should rise against neighbor, when every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee to Zion for safety, In Zion, there should be peace. Now, as I have said, it is one of the most extraordinary features connected with the work of our God. And when it seemed as though the whole power of the nation was combining from every part of the land, excretions loading loading the air against the Mormons of Utah territory, petitions coming up by the thousands, popular prejudice appealing to popular prejudice, and entreating the use of bayonets, of cannon, and musketry to destroy us, and when it seemed as though Congress was in such a mood that it was already that it was ready to pass any law or to frame any enactment to accomplish those ends, that in the midst of all this unreasoning excitement in Utah territory, in the breast of Latter Day Saints, wherever they dwelt in these mountain fa- uh, fastnesses or scattered abroad among the nations of the earth, there was a spirit of unfailing peace, a spirit of quietude a spirit of serenity, a spirit of calm and undismayed resignation, awaiting quietly and patiently the good providence of our God, knowing that in and of themselves they were helpless to defend themselves against these attacks, but having unshaking confidence in the promises which God had made to his people. O oh, most wonderful, most wonderful exhibition of calmness, most wonderful exhibition of consistent faith, most wonderful exhibition of fortitude, of courage, and of unfailing trust in the almighty power of that God, whose existence so many in the world deny. A rare example to the nations of the earth of the willingness of a people to put their trust in their God, even to the very uttermost. Now, my brethren and sisters, if there is any great peculiarity connected with us as a people that is noticeable, uh, it is this. You can notice it in yourselves. You can notice it in your brethren and sisters. You can notice it in your children. Presidents of stakes can notice it. The bishop can notice it. The bishop's counselors can notice it. The high counselors <coughs> are witnessing of it. The entire body of priesthood must see the exhibition of these qualities among the people to this wonderful extent. God be praised for it. I feel to praise him for it from the bottom of my heart that he has poured out upon his people this spirit of peace. We have laid down in peace. We have slept in peace. We have risen in peace. We have gone out in peace. 
we have come in peace. We have prayed in our families in peace. We have gone forth to our labors in peace. We have returned home therefrom in peace. We have met together in our assemblies in peace. We, uh, The peace of heaven, the peace of Almighty God has descended upon this people, and it has rested upon them in their congregations, in their social associations. God has given unto us this precious blessing. It is beyond price. How thankful we ought to be that amidst all these murderous threats that have been made against us, he has given unto us this feeling which has deprived us of all fear. Such a spectacle is unexampled in the history of the earth and all its inhabitants. That is in our our day. (coughs) Look where you will, travel where you will, mingle with people where you may. Uh, You behold nothing like this. And thus God is bearing witness to the inhabitants of the earth that he is able to fulfill his promises to protect his people and to pour out upon them that precious and heavenly gift that is beyond all price. And they dwell, uh, they dwell in it and they enjoy it. Their wives and their children enjoy it. And there is no fear in the hearts of any faithful man or woman or child within the confines of our land or in any of the adjacent territories where our people dwell. So here you go. Uh, In this case, they are having physical peace. They're having spiritual and physical peace because they're gathered to the stakes of Zion, wherever that may be. Okay, the next one, this is uh, Elder John A. Widso. If ye are prepared, he shall not fear. April 1942 General Conference. This is him. He was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, in case you didn't know. He says, speaking to the church about the events of the last days, the Lord said, the wicked shall flee unto Zion for safety. Since Zion is wherever the pure in heart are, I like to read into that inspired saying that there is safety wherever the people of the Lord live, so worthily as to claim the sacred title of citizens of the Zion of our God. Otherwise, the name Zion is but an empty sound. The only safety that we can expect in this or any other calamitous time lies in our conformity to gospel requirements. So this is where the protection comes from. (coughs) It comes from living within your covenants. It doesn't come from um, lasers or blasters or force fields or uh, some, you know, power that only God can wield, uh, except for in this case. And what I mean, like a supernatural type, you know, cinematic power. It's simply living within your covenants, going to church, being gathered to your local stake, going to the temple and receiving that that peace and protection uh, that you receive from doing that. Okay, the next one, this is Harold B. Lee, uh, April 1948 General Conference. Uh, He says, six years after the church was organized, the keys of gathering were committed to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple. The record of that marvelous restoration is given in these words. After this vision closed, the heavens were again opened unto us, and Moses appeared before us and committed unto us uh, the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. The spirit of gathering has been with the church from the days of that restoration. Those who are of the blood of Israel have a righteous desire after they are baptized to gather together with the body of the saints at the designated place. This we have come to recognize uh, is but the breath, the breath of God upon those who are converted, turning them to the promises made to their fathers, places of gathering. But the designation of gathering places is qualified in another revelation by the Lord to which I would desire to call your attention After designating certain places in that day where the saints were to gather, the Lord said this, Until the day cometh that there is found no more room for them, and then I have other places which I appoint unto them. Thus clearly, the Lord has placed the responsibility for directing the work of gathering in the hands of the leaders of the church, to whom he will reveal his will uh, where and when such gatherings would take place in the future. It would be well before the frightening events concerning the fulfillment of all God's promises and predictions are upon us that the saints in every land prepare themselves and look forward to the instruction that shall come to them from the first presidency of this church as to where they shall be gathered and not be disturbed in their feelings until such instruction is given them as it is revealed by the Lord to the proper authority. 
Refuge from the storm. Again, in 1838, the Lord gave a further reason for the gathering. Verily I say unto all, Arise and shine forth, that thy light might, might be a standard for the nations. And that the gathering together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Why was it to be called a place of refuge and a place of safety? Said the Lord in another revelation, the glory of the Lo- sorry, the glory of the Lord shall be there and the terror of the Lord also shall be there insomuch that the wicked will not come un- will not come unto it and it shall be called Zion. The time when these things shall shall be would be as the Lord said when the wicked shall slay the wicked, the fear and fear shall come upon every man, and the saints also shall hardly escape. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, am with them and will come down in heaven uh, from the presence of my father and consume the wicked with unquenchable fire. Another and further reason for the gathering is given us with this revelation. Wherefore, seeing that I, the Lord, have decreed all these things upon the face of the earth, I will that my saints should be assembled upon the land of Zion. And that every man should take righteousness in his hands and faithfulness upon his loins and lift a warning voice unto the inhabitants of the earth and declare both by word and by flight that desolation shall come upon the wicked. As we sit here today, we should be mindful of the fact that uh, we are those of whom these revelations have spoken. Okay, in 1948, he's saying, the people at that time, and of course, by extension, it would include us now in, in uh, 2023 at the time that I'm recording this. We are those who have been gathered out from uh, out of spiritual Babylon, or perhaps we represent the second or third or even fourth or fifth generation of those who heeded the call and felt the spirit of gathering. Just as was the case in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith, so in our day, the leaders of the church have told us that Satan has been lying in wait to deceive and seeking whom he might devour. Warning of dangers. As I have thought about these things, I've been sobered by the realization that during my lifetime, three presidents of this church have spoken upon those dangers which are within the church, which are seeking to destroy us and defeat the purpose of our gathering. It was President Joseph F. Smith who said, uh, quote, There are at least three dangers that threaten the church within. The authorities need to awaken to the fact that the people should be warned unceasingly against them. As I see these, they are flattery of prominent men in the world, false educational ideas, and sexual impurity. But the third subject mentioned, personal purity, is perhaps of greater importance than either of the other two. We believe in one standard of morality for men and women. If purity of life is neglected... All other dangers set in upon us like the rivers of waters when the floodgates are opened. Okay, we have just two more. Um, At the time, Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And then we have Elder David R. Stone of the Seventy. This talk from uh, Elder Oaks uh, is from the April 2004 General Conference. It's called Preparation for the Second Coming. I have not seen any other talks like this where he gives a list like this of what the signs of the times are and the signs that we should be looking uh, looking for to know that the second coming is near. And uh, he divides his talk up into sections, and there's this section that has to do with the gathering. And this is what he says. Another sign of the times is the gathering of the faithful. In the early years of this last dispensation, a gathering design involved various locations in the United States to Kirtland, to Missouri, to Nauvoo, and to the tops of the the mountains. Always, these were gatherings to prospective temples. With the creation of stakes and the construction of temples in most nations with sizable populations of the faithful, the current commandment is not to gather to one place, but to gather in stakes in our homelands. There, the faithful can enjoy the full blessings of eternity in a house of the Lord. There, In their own homelands, they can obey the Lord's command to enlarge the borders of his people and strengthen her stakes. In this way, the stakes of Zion are uh, the stakes of Zion are for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Okay, and then to finish it off, 
We have a talk called Zion in the Midst of Babylon by Elder David R. Stone of the 70. This is the April 2006 General Conference. If Babylon is the city of the world, (coughs) Zion is the city of God. The Lord has said of Zion, Zion cannot be built up unless it, it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. And for this is Zion the pure in heart. Wherever we are, whatever city we may live in, we can build our own Zion by the principles of the celestial kingdom and ever seek to become the pure in heart. Zion is the beautiful and the Lord hold, holds it in his own hands. Our homes can be places where, uh, which are a refuge and protection as Zion is. We do not need to become as puppets in the hands of the culture of a place and time. We can be courageous and can walk in the Lord's paths and follow his footsteps. And if we do, we will be called Zion and we will be the people of the Lord. I pray that we will be strengthened to resist the onslaught of Babylon and that we can create Zion in our homes, in our communities. Indeed, that we may have Zion in the midst of Babylon. We seek Zion because it is the habitation of our Lord who is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. In Zion and from Zion, his luminous and incandescent light will shine forth and he will rule forever. I bear witness that he lives and loves us and will watch over us. Okay, so hopefully that clears that up. Uh, These were just a few of the quotes I feel explain it really well. So it's not about going to some place where there's going to be these superpowers that protect you. Um, although the, the Lord will protect his people in a physical way at times, but it more has to do with gathering to the stakes of Zion, going to the temple, living within your covenants, and then receiving that peace and refuge from the world. And when you look at the world, there is a lot of contention. There's a lot of fighting going on, and we don't have to be part of that. We can live in a celestial way, which is devoid of, of contention and fighting. You don't have to take up your your sword against your neighbor, you know, and maybe set a, set an example for them and invite them to be part of Zion. But um, we don't have to be part of that, even though the whole world the whole world is at each other's throats. Okay, that's gonna be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.